Now we want to start off with a, a mate. Well, I think I'm, I'm torn. I've got a me, two, two immediate uh, uh, new developments in medicine to talk about with you. Uh, as as you are one of the leading medical researchers and certainly one of the most experienced medical researchers in the country. Now we actually came on to talk about the uh, the, the the new. Uh, bacterial stimulation of the immune system that you've developed mm. but j just chatting before we came on we talked about about the importance of vitamin D which ties mm. in with the, the talks on David Grimes yesterday mm. uh, j j just briefly how important is it to be vitamin D replete when treating cancers well it, it, it is so important that it, it is, is pointless I believe treating cancer patients until you've got their vitamin D level high or uh, supplement it with D3 or calciferol uh, it is so important and the literature is replete out there I mean the uh, since we first uh, s spotted it with regards to immunotherapy why do some people fail and other people respond and we spent two years or spent lots of uh, money on looking at everything going and then the vitamin D test becomes available to yeah. us and it's immediately obvious if you've got a low vitamin D it's a waste of time giving them immunotherapy. So, and, so if it's sophisticated immunotherapy treatments some people respond some people don't respond mm -hmm. and you find out it's the non-responders have got low levels of vitamin D and the responders have got adequate levels of vitamin D. C can it be that simple? It is that simple. And it revolutionized our treatment because we measured everybody's vitamin D before going on any treatment. We got it to a decent level. And that's why our randomized study using uh, IMM 101, which is mm. the heat kill bacteria we're talking about, that's why that trial showed a benefit because we had corrected vitamin D deficiency. Now, there's so many papers out there now. I mean, there's one meta-analysis paper of 88,000 patients looking at patients in trials with all sorts of treatment, all sorts of cancers, where they had measured the vitamin D before starting, and they had some centers which corrected it and others that just left it measured. And the ones that corrected it had a 13% improvement in clinical outcome whether it be chemotherapy, radiotherapy, mixtures of surgery, whatever it was. And to show you how important this is, that tamoxifen was the, uh, the ER blocker for breast cancer, the world's first big uh, blockbuster pharmaceutical, had an 8% improvement. So that, that really puts it into context how important this is. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that I'm just horrified that I get... Uh, calls for people for a second opinion why they haven't responded uh, and they've had very very good treatment and I'm just horrified that they go to top cancer centers and they've never bothered to measure the vitamin D in spite of all these papers and I had a guy the other day I couldn't I measured his vitamin D and it basically they couldn't measure it it was so low so all we have to do to improve his outcome is to greatly improve that vitamin D and I, I do find, and this is a problem of big pharma driving, uh, yeah. driving the, the process, the protocols. They're not interested in vitamin D, so it's not even mentioned a lot of these protocols. And it, it is, it, I, I believe it's negligent. I think yeah. the data is so strong, it's negligent not to measure vitamin D before you start treating a cancer patient. I mean, we've got all the Bradford Hill criteria, really. Mm. We, we, we've, got, we've got the epidemiological correlates. We've got mm. the associations. Mm. We've, we've got the before and after. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've, we've got the temporal correlation. We, we've got plausible mechanisms, the, the immunomodulatory, immuno-optimizing effects mm -hmm. of vitamin D. Mm. It all makes perfect sense. I mean, uh, poor Bradford Hill. I mean, I mean, you know, Austin might be turning in his grave at this because... You know, why, why bother doing all this work when it's ignored? It's just... Exactly. I mean, it's such a waste of mm. really expensive drugs. And, uh, you know, one of the things, when we, when we presented the pancreatic data with IMM 101 and, uh, at, at ASCO, and uh, we were the only people to have a survival benefit with a so-called immunotherapy, and the big classic ones that worked for melanoma didn't work. 
and one of the guys and I presented it said you know why is yours the only one works and all the others don't work you know like he just didn't believe us yeah. and I said well you'll find that probably we're the only trial that's ever looked at vitamin D levels before we you we randomize you on the trial and make sure that it's corrected it's that simple well this guy had done thousands of patients on clinical trials for pancreatic cancer and he said I've never heard of this he calls me up three months later he said I set it as a project to somebody because all our samples for years are stored and he said I cannot believe it he said the only people that respond to chemotherapy are the only people that have normal vitamin D. He said it is black and white. And he said we certainly will be changing our practice after that. It's, 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 the medical establish, establishment just seems obtuse. Mm. They're just determined to be unteachable for, for bizarre reasons. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you want something like 40 milligrams per mil, which is 100 nanomoles per litre, Gus. Yes. Does that sound about...? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's the crucial level. The, uh, the NHS sets it at 50 and say anything over 50 is fine. No, it's not, because it's taken from the normal range of the population and the normal population yeah. is uh, chronically deficient in vitamin D. So with all my years of experience looking at when people benefit it's over a hundred a hundred nanomoles and it's not high dose it's per not liter. Toxic because normal's up to 200 yep but it just shows you that the majority of people are sitting 30 40 and some of them i've had as low as 7 or 19 mm. i mean it's unbelievable and they look fine but they don't respond it's that yeah. simple and you know people still say to me why are you going on about this everybody knows it's on only important in rickets <laughs> <laughs> It is important in rickets, but yeah. that was the insight. It's important in everything. Yeah, it's just the absolutely. Just showed up first. I mean, and are, are you? Slightly it's a different question, but are you fairly convinced in your own mind that maintaining good levels of vitamin D is going to reduce the probability of developing certain types of cancer? Well, I, at the time, I really looked about the the, the data that proved that supplementing to the normal level when the diagnosis was made was just completely uh, it was a hundred percent correlation definitely they did said they struggled to find whether uh, supplementing vitamin d prevented the cancer so but that may be part of the difficulty the methodology in which they were looking at i i greatly believe that uh, because the vitamin D is so important to your immune function, particularly your innate immune function, that it makes perfect sense to supplement absolutely everybody over a, uh, a certain age. Well, 50 is the age when your cancer rate starts to go up. So having everybody at a good vitamin D level then. Then, of course, as a side effect, you just buff off flu, COVID, all these things. And I looked at data suggesting you've got a good vitamin D level. It's far more effective to prevent you from flu than flu vaccines. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there are four papers saying that, so I'm not committing any yeah. heresy. Or, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's out there. And, uh, I mean, that's if I was uh, CMO, that's what I'd be pushing for, not for all these vaccine programmes. And is there, is there any downside to maintaining a vitamin D level of 100 nanomoles per litre? Will I get any horrible side effects if I do well, that? absolutely none, unless you go into renal failure. And uh, if you're in renal failure, the uh, vitamin D can build up and, and uh, enhance it. Or if you have certain rare phosphate uh, mm. problems, uh, pathways. Mm. But apart from that, I mean, I have seen people who go over the top and they take tens of thousands and they're... Mm vitamin D is well over 200 uh, they don't seem to go into trouble but you don't want that mm. because it is excreted up by the kidneys and it could cause um, kidney stones and renal failure it, 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 indeed yeah mm. but I mean li limiting the dose of drug it, it, that's universally true for every single drug isn't it in renal it failure absolutely yeah you know it, you know you give maybe a tenth of the dose of an antibiotic or give right. the doses 10 times less frequently because mm. you're not excreting you mm. haven't got the renal excretion so that is totally fascinating and bewildering in equal measures I think 
Yeah, but the great, but thing, about, the great thing about vitamin D is the assay is so easy. Yeah. It's so straightforward. To so test you're the not levels. Guessing. You're not guessing. You're not throwing things into the wind. You're giving a level. You're seeing it into the normal range. And you suggest this should keep you there. And you can two months later, you can check it out. And it's, and it's a very simple titration to do. Simple. Just, I mean, if every, everything was this simple, it would be wonderful. But it is that simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's why we need professors <laughs> to, to do the clever, the, the, the more sophisticated things.